go! LSU losing their best player from last year. That was Zach Van Rosenberg. One of the, if not the, greatest punter ever at LSU. We'll have that discussion today. Yes, this is a punter's episode. Punters are people, too, in the words of the famous Pat McAfee. So, let's have a, a weird show today. I know a lot of you want to talk recruiting. I'll throw some recruiting thoughts in at the end. And how about Ed Ingram? He's coming back. And we're going to talk about that LSU running game. Should the Tigers actually stick with their same offensive line from last year? So, go on ahead, subscribe to the channel. So, ZVR NFL Draft, here he is with the great Ed Orgeron. Obviously, uh, Zach Van Rosenberg actually tweeted this out himself. But this is just such a great photo. Two Louisiana legends, okay? And before we get to... Uh, ZVR statement. I want you to look at this from Shay. Louisiana Misters Baseball two times. High School Baseball State Champion four times. MLB Draft Pick. Walk on tight end. All SEC punter, SEC and national champion. But at 30 years old, Zach Van Rosenberg is not only the oldest player in college football, but he's also older than 23 starting punters. Here is the heir apparent to Zach Van Rosenberg, signee for the class of 2021, Peyton Todd out of West Monroe. He was a West Monroe Rebel, Will Blackwell, Barkevius Mingo, the list goes on and on. Um, the great players that have played there. And a lot like um, Zach Van Rosenberg, as you can see here, the number one punter in America. So if he's the number one punter, why is he only a three-star recruit? I, I've never understood that. Because at his position, he's actually a five-star, and this actually goes against LSU's composite ranking, but not here nor there. Greg McMahon, of course, the special teams coordinator for LSU. Um, the number one punter, but something that makes Peyton Todd very interesting is is that this kid is actually an athlete. So normally when you think punters, you think non-athletic people. But like Zach Van Rosenberg, this dude's huge. Six foot five, two ten. And Peyton Todd also actually played some linebacker for West Monroe. So, you know, Brad Wing was kind of the, the same size as ZVR, as was Donnie Jones. So, Peyton Todd, what a player. I, I think he's just going to step right in, win this job, and LSU will be fine and merry. And I think overall on special teams, LSU does get Cade York back, their field goal kicker, and they should be getting Avery Atkins, their kickoff specialist, back next year as well. So, what does Peyton Todd actually have to follow at LSU? Well, he's got to follow the third best punter in the SEC based on on average. So Jake Camarda, uh, obviously clearly averaged more, but ZVR had the most punts this year in terms of punts per game. So this is actually a good and a bad thing. This shows that ZVR, even though he had to punt way more than Jake Camarda, he averaged a full three punts more per game this actually isn't a good thing that LSU had to punt a lot. Number one, when you punt the football a lot, that means your offense is being stopped and it's being stalled. It also shows that your coach isn't aggressive on going for it on fourth down. We've seen this throughout the bowl season. Coaches punting way too much. Georgia and Cincinnati both butched punting attempts at the end of the game, and lucky enough, Georgia was still able to win it. But look at this. This is this should never happen. ZVR played in nine games, and he had 13 more punts than the second highest punter. We averaged a full punt more per game than Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt and Tennessee. So I understand if you have ZVR, you want to use him as, as, as many times as you want because he is an effective punter. He's really good at downing people inside their own 20. 
But you also don't want to punt. And I talked about this even with the 2019 team. Ed Orgeron going for it on fourth and one against Alabama at their 42-yard line was such a bad coaching decision. You know, we can't be married to the idea of punting every single time on fourth down. And LSU, once again, I think wasn't aggressive enough on fourth down this year. You compare it to, obviously, you know, the all-time great LSU team. 47 punts in 14 games. 3.4 punts per game was actually one of the fewest amounts of punts per game in the SEC, especially considering LSU played 15 total games. So that is absolutely wild. So obviously, we've got to get better in that category. So here's Brooks Cabuena of The Advocate giving us a good little rundown of who's coming back and who's going thus far. Tory Carter, Race McMath, we've done the video on that. We did Eric Gilbert's video as well. All of those uh, you could just find on our page. Ed Ingram, Jason Hines, Neil Farrell, Ali Gay, and Liam Shanahan. And this is actually the first time we're talking about Jason Hines coming back as well, along with Ed Ingram. So the question is do you want the same starting offensive line? Here is, I believe, Chase and Hines and Ed Ingram working along. I think that's jersey number 57. Um, practicing here. Do you want to keep the same LSU starting offensive line next year? Let's take a look. So here's Ed Ingram's official statement for coming back. Like Zach Van Rosenberg, one of the more entertaining follows on Twitter. Uh, if you like to follow current LSU players, another year. And eh, what the heck, let's ride. Look at that face. So, Ed Ingram was a mixed bag this year. I think he played through a lot more injury than what was put out there. I think his body was hurting because the games where he had an extra week to rest and prepare were his better games. He destroyed a South Carolina front that was actually one of the better units on their team. And I've said this plenty of times, his game versus South Carolina was as good of a game I've ever seen an LSU guard play. Unfortunately, the rest of the games weren't as good as that. And, you know, we we go through the offensive line depth. Obviously, Jason Hines coming back. Ed Ingram here. Liam Shanahan. I know a lot of you have questions about Cardell Thomas. Charles Turner's an interesting guy from the IMG Academy. Uh, Xavier Hill, part of that class of 2020, the three-star guard. Anthony Bradford was a four-star, a top uh, 250 player. Marcus Dummerville was the only four-star in the 2020 class that committed. Austin Deculus, a big decision coming up for him. Multiple-year starter. Wasn't his best season, but overall he was a solid player. So uh, we go to Marlon Martinez, a decent player in his own right, coming out of St. Thomas Aquinas, a very loaded high school with rich NFL history. Uh, he actually got a few snaps this year. So what should the starting offensive line look like? Should LSU stick with the same unit that they did last year? So if you're new to the channel, We've done a few offensive line deep dives. I never like to be too critical of a certain player, especially in a year with the pandemic. But this right here is your interior of the LSU offensive line coming back. And I know if you're James Craig, you would like to start the same unit from last year because they're probably going to get better in the offseason. And they do have that cohesion. The problem is that it took Liam Shanahan a little bit before he actually started dominating. I thought his Alabama game was excellent, um, and he actually started to play really well. Like I said, Ed Ingram, when he's fully healthy, is actually a really good player. But Chase and Hines, in particular, the games that were the toughest on the schedule, when you're going up against athletes that are as talented as you, Texas A&M, Alabama, and Florida, the game tape was... A mixed bag, putting it lightly. So you would hope, because Ed Orgeron hyped up Chase and Hines so much during the offseason, 
I honestly thought he would have been better. Now, once again, I don't know if he was going through injury. I don't know if it was all the other starters developing that cohesiveness and changing of the quarterbacks. Was it some issues with the running backs? Let's actually take a deeper look. This isn't good. This is not LSU football. When LSU is averaging 3.33 yards per carry, once again, the LSU Tigers average 3.33 yards per carry. Now, this is a complicated thing because obviously if you watch the film studies, I give empirical evidence of this LSU offensive line missing assignments and all of that is true, okay? But the LSU running backs didn't make a lot of tacklers miss. Uh, I, I was shocked at how often they fed Chris Curry the ball when his longest run of the year was 13 yards. He had 45 carries for like 150 yards. So I, I, I don't know why that they were giving him the football so much when the stats in the film showed that he was rushing the football suboptimally. Now, as far as John Emory Jr. and Ty Davis Price is concerned, it was a mixed bag. Now, obviously, TDP's game against Arkansas was, you know, pretty legendary, all things considered. But, you know, other than that, there wasn't too many times where he just flat out dominated. The same is true for John Emory. He had the breakout game against Vanderbilt, obviously the worst team in the SEC. But other than that, both of them had their injury issues. It's hard to run at a shotgun with immobile quarterbacks. That obviously didn't help them out either. They actually performed better when Max Johnson was in the game because he does have the threat to pull the ball on the zone read, which opens up some of the holes in the running game. You can see our Florida film study where we show you that compared to TJ Finley and whatever. All those things factor in, but when you also factor in inconsistent blocking, when you also factor in the loss of Joe Brady, when you also factor in that a lot of the running backs didn't really make a lot of explosive runs, it didn't really make a whole lot of people miss, this gets you 3.3 yards per carry. Just for reference, LSU, 2019, 4.88 yards per carry. But, and this was a passing offense, and obviously, you know, Clyde was a monster. Go to 2018. Wasn't a great year, 12th in the SEC, but at least it's not 3.33 yards per carry. Keep this in mind, Tennessee was last in the SEC with 3.70 yards per carry. This putrid Tennessee offense for 2018 still averaged far better yards per carry than we did this year. And obviously, you know, this goes on and on, 2017, 4.79 yards per carry. Then in 2016, obviously, these are the Fournette Geis years, 6.09, 6.10, 4.70. And guess who was the run game coordinator during this time? Oh, uh, yeah, Jeff Grimes, my number one candidate for the LSU offensive coordinator. So this is all these questions that Ed Orgeron's going to have to answer. What was the issue with the offensive line? What about the 3.3 yards per carry? Who is the offensive coordinator that can fix this? What are we going to do defensively to coexist with our offense? Because those two things intertwine. So I know a lot of you expected a recruiting video, and we did a live stream yesterday. I'm not going to lie. How that Army All-American game, game actually played itself out, and some of the things that I've learned with what actually happened behind the scenes with some of those recruits, it's troubled me. Like, I don't know what we can do to fix what happened with Tristan Lee and Jarden Gilbert. And here's the thing. A lot of people would say that I'm just sour grapes about them not going to LSU. I'm not. As many of you know on this channel, I don't care where a recruit goes. They can do whatever they want. The point being is that they were already signed to their universities while also getting actively recruited by other universities. Even if it was LSU that signed them, that is some very shady, weird stuff. And I'm not trying to call them out. It's just I think the early signing period should be abolished. So I'm going to do a video about that 
hopefully in the next few days as I learn more about the early signing period behind the scenes. So, I hope you enjoyed this video, all right? It's power, our LSU, boom! ZVR, the legend. Oh, we're doing salmon tonight. Let's go, slamming salmon.